In the name of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Can I just say it's an absolute pleasure to be back with you this day on what, frankly, I think is a beautiful morning. And it's lovely that the church is open and it's just a, it's a wonderful atmosphere. So thank you. I'm going to preach the whole sermon right now. What words might you describe yourself? If you feel you can unpack that completely right now, you can tune out for the next 10, 12 minutes, because that's exactly where I'm going to end. But really, I'm going to ask you, what is your story? What words do you describe yourself? And crucially, and this is where it gets a bit deeper, what words do you describe yourself to yourself and what, how might you describe yourself to others? Are you introverted or extroverted? Are you active? Or maybe you think yourself as being you know, a party person or maybe a bit shy. We've got all these words that we, are, we use about ourselves, both to ourselves and to others. I was actually thinking just now about the you might remember this, the American-Canadian actor Michael J. Fox. Do you remember Back to the Future movies? And the tragedy of him being struck down by Parkinson's disease. And I can almost remember the shock when his autobiography came out and it was titled, does anyone remember the title? Lucky. And it was almost how could you call yourself lucky if all this has befallen you? But he could and he does. Now, I'm just going to say none of these questions I'm asking are easy questions. It's actually quite a, a subtle thing how we think about ourselves and how we think others think about us. But I want to suggest that it's a very human thing, in a sense, to, to attach stories to one another. We do it all the time, and often we do it just with a couple of words. Um, I was back in the UK, there's no hiding, I've got that kind of UK accent. I was back in the UK uh, in the midst of our winter, in the midst of their warm summer. And um, meeting up with my family, which is now based in the north of England. And quite often you'd end up with conversations with my mother and my sister there, where my mother would be saying, "Will you remember so and so? And the, my eyes would be glazed because I've got no idea who she's talking about. And she might go a bit harder. You remember Mrs. Everton. She was your dinner lady. And then, if I'm still kind of a bit puzzled, she might say, you remember her. She has a sing-song voice. She's got dark hair. She was always smiley. And she would just attach words to a person to help you, in a sense, or help me get my memory of her. I'm just pausing for a second. I really hope that isn't just a function of my mother and my family. I suspect for this sermon to work, it's something most of us do when we're trying to help someone remember someone else. We attach, in a sense, words from a story to them. You know, I've just got one here. You remember Mrs. Coombs, my mum might say, you remember her dance so elegantly at that barn dance in 1975. My mum credits me with a very long memory. But if I may ask, we attach stories to others, but we do attach stories to ourselves, words to ourselves. And in a sense, this whole sermon is, what is your story? What clutch of adjectives might you use to describe yourself? Are you precise? or punctual, precocious, or precious, petulant, or practical, or placid, or popular, or pleasant, prickly, or powerful? Might you be honest enough to say pompous, or puny? Might you describe yourself as petite, or pretty, or perfect? <laughs> and that's just the letter P. So there are lots of possibilities. Now, Getting to our gospel, the gospel reading we had today is a magnificent story. 
it's a great story of a man short in stature, who in the eyes of all his, the people he, know, he knows, his neighbours, he is a sinner because he is a tax collector. Just for a moment, think what it must be like to be that person, to have those kind of words attached to you. I can almost imagine my mother saying to me, you remember Zacchaeus, he was at the funeral back in night of Mr. Thomas. And me being pausing, she said, you remember him, he is the short tax collector. That would be enough, in a sense, to get you to remember who he was. A life summed up in just a couple of words. Now, of course, not all tax collectors are short in stature. But just think what it must have been like in Jesus' time to be a short tax collector. If that's hard to do, to think what that must be like, what must it be like to be a, um, a rent collector who is short in stature in this world here? Whenever I've seen TV shows when there are people coming around, the bailiffs coming around, one thing they're not is short in stature. I was watching a program on ABC TV uh, a while ago about what it is to be a man and to be short in stature and how literally uh, short men are often overlooked in so many areas of life. In one televised experiment, this was in a busy street in New York, they had a, a camera video this guy walking down the street and basically it counted how many times this guy was buffeted and knocked about just walking down the street. And then they refilmed it with a man who was broad-shouldered and tall. The difference, of course, is staggering. Not surprisingly, the tall person with broad shoulders was not buffeted or knocked about at all. People, in a sense, make way for that person. But for the man, short in stature, it was something like 20 times that they were buffeted or knocked in just the space of 20 metres. Now, one of the only things that we really know about Zacchaeus is that he is short in stature. So short that he can't see through or over the crowds and that he had to scramble up a sycamore tree to see Jesus. By the way, one of the things I just want to note, have you ever noticed how in artwork Jesus is presented as being either average or above average height? I don't think in the whole of my life I have ever seen a presentation of Jesus as short. Why not? There is a really intriguing idea built into this story if Jesus was really, really tall and was head and shoulders above everyone else, someone who was short in stature would be able to see because of the angles. There's a hint, just a hint, that Jesus isn't that tall in this story. But of course, the other thing that we know about Zacchaeus is that he is a tax collector. That is a really looked down upon job back in the first century. And just note what I'm saying there, a looked down upon job. We even give stature to jobs. I have enough difficulty being an ordained person at parties. You, if I want to be honest, ask any cleric really. You go to a party and you're anonymous and people chat to you and they say, well, what job do you do? And you say, well, I'm a priest. And even try now, to, I'm a bishop. Ha! <laughs> the conversation dies quite quickly. Um, <laughs> But I just want to say, imagine going to a party and saying you're a bailiff. I think that's a really tough one to do. So Zacchaeus is the short tax collector. And that was his lot back in the town of Jericho. Oh, and there's one other thing that we know about him. One other thing in the story. He's rich. And in a way, that is Zacchaeus. He's the rich, short tax collector. Whatever way you sort it, it doesn't sound like his life is going to be that good, does it? Those 
words attached to a person. But now think what happens in that gospel reading. When Jesus sees him and he invites himself to Zacchaeus' house for a meal. And the question is, what's going on there? And I want to keep, in a sense, the frame big of what's going on there. Because it seems to me what Jesus is doing is rewriting someone's story. In a sense, the short, rich taxman becomes the hospitable, friendly friend of Jesus. In just a few fleeting moments, Jesus provides Zacchaeus with the opportunity of rewriting the script that he has to his own life. And to his eternal credit, Zacchaeus takes that on. He takes it with both hands and he declares that he's going to live his life differently. From now on, he's going to be the fair, even generous, contributing to charity tax collector. Generous, fair, friendly, hospitable. What words to shape your story? We know the Bible is full of stories. It's absolutely packed full of great stories. And often it seems to me as Christians, we get hung up on whether they happened just as they are written in the text. But it seems to me that there's another way, in a sense, of us just appreciating these stories, to look at these ancient, treasured stories and say, what are they actually saying to us? What are they saying about us? How can we let these stories reshape our stories? Or to put it another way, and appreciate this is a bit provocative, but faith isn't really about how many things you can believe, as if a faithful person is rather like the queen in Alice through the looking glass, believing six impossible things before breakfast. That is not um, a mark of faith. I think faith can be marked much more by how we allow these stories to shape our lives and how we can, in a sense, give ourselves permission to live life with a new story. That's what we're being invited here to do, to allow these stories and even this gospel today to reshape our own stories. And what would it be like if our stories became like Zacchaeus' story, that we were known for being persistent, courageous, perhaps even daring, adventurous, hospitable, and friendly. What is your story? And what would you like your story to be? Amen.